Nick, uh, this is Tom. Do you know when the uh, BAS meeting is going to be in July? You're muted. Yeah, sorry, I don't yet know. <laughs> oh, okay, because I'm uh, I'm going to be going up to Maine on vacation and coming back the end of July. I was going to stop by and have lunch with Al Foster, but I was wondering if there's a, a meeting maybe it could swing into that. Usually we shoot for the third Sunday, um, uh, but that's only a guide. Yeah. Okay. Depends on the speaker, their schedule, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, I'll check a little bit later to see if you've got a date. Yep. Probably okay. Won't know, probably won't know till the June meeting or something. <laughs> <laughs> Have a very short planning cycle, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I um, I haven't been to Boston in a few years, so uh, on the way back, we're going up to uh, Maine to visit some friends, and then uh, go up into Canada. And on the way back, I was just going to stop by. Sounds like a cool trip. <laughs> yep. Hopefully it won't be as cool as it is right now, though. <laughs> <laughs> True. It's had a couple days of heat, and now it's back to the cold. I prefer the heat a little. <laughs> yep. Hey, Alan, glad to see you made it. Sorry for now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good day. I've only known you a couple months. Yeah. <laughs> Alan and I were at the New Jersey Audio Society meeting this afternoon, so it's been a busy day. You did like those speakers, right? Oh, they were great. Worth, <laughs> worth the trip. They were magicos and they were magic. Yeah. Of course, there's a lot of stuff at that price, but at that price, everyone should be. Yeah. Yeah, a lot more than I spend, that's for sure. I keep wondering how many people are out there that can afford that. But obviously, Magico's in business, Wilson's in business, you know, a fair number of other companies sell product in that price range. I... Um... I have, you know, the friend Dave Burning who makes those uh, Zotal amplifiers. And his latest iteration, which is an 845 single-ended monoblock, the pair sell for $200,000. Yeah. He sells them. I mean, not obviously not as many as Sony sells uh, receivers, but uh, there are people that buy it. Is he selling it to professional installations or individuals? No, he has one dealer in San Diego, and uh, his uh, his first name is Rick. I forgot his last name, and he goes all over the world physically and sells them and installs them. So obviously, he has a substantial amount of overhead in selling those. Uh, but uh, no, they're all, as far as I know, they all go to uh, audiophiles in their homes. If you get a chance, ask him how many he sells a year. I'm curious now. Uh, I don't know for sure, but it's probably, I don't know what, maybe 15, 20 pair a year or something like that. That's a lot. Well, yeah, in that price range. Overhead, right, basically. Well, yeah, the, the biggest problem is when you get something like that, every installation is like a major thing where somebody has to go and – First of all, go out on location and talk to the users, and they they have to get them and install them and do all the setups and everything. So uh, that's probably the the biggest part of the cost is the the marketing and the installation. The closest I know, and this is forty years old, so prices were different at things. I remember the Rogers importer sold the speaker, the BBC speaker called the LS58 which was an electronically crossed over 12 inch with a 
one and an eighth inch tone. And I wanted to reveal it. So I asked if I could, as I was writing for a stereo file then when Gordon still had it. And he said, why don't you do the passive version? As if we don't, well, oh, we only sell three of these a year. <laughs> I said to him, well, how many of the passive version, which obviously, I think it was eight grand, which is a lot in the, the 1980. How many of the passive version do you sell? He said three. <laughs> so eventually I had the LS58 for a month. And given it was a 12 inch and uh, like I said, a one and eighth inch uh, French soft dome, where it's day, it was awfully good. Oh, the, the pair I had, and they changed this later, the 12 inch woofer was slot loaded. So that, you know, which increases the dispersion across it. I think later they stopped doing that. I'm not sure why. Hmm. Fascinating speaker. So I assume these products are uh, manufactured as they're purchased. Um, actually, uh, Dave does build a few of them ahead of time, but you know, just a few. So it is the, let's put it this way. The manufacturing just slightly, um, is in advance of the purchases. Mm -hmm. I would bet Wilson does a run of his, of the, uh, Alex, for instance, um, at that probably did runs of it because it actually was the, the the big BBC monitor at the time, so the BBC was purchasing. From well, Dave Zodal design, you know, he has that patented. It's pretty interesting way to yeah. get rid of the output transformers on tube amps. Very different than most of the other OTLs. Um, and and as I mentioned today, when I saw you, I just uh, had the first half of an article published on Audio Express and rebuilding. Uh, a 300B Zodal that somebody didn't like the way it looked, so I put it in a nicer looking chassis. But uh, there's a description in the first article of, of how the Zodal works if you're interested. You can also find it on Dave's side. He's got the patent there, but it's you got to want to go through the patent. <laughs> yeah, patents are hard to read and sometimes deceptive. I mean, I remember the patent on the Dahlquist, you know, and ev everybody misunderstood what it was. Everybody yeah. assumed it was the time alignment had nothing to do with the patent. Hmm. The I patent, never read the patent. Wait, wait to hear this. You remember the how the doll, it was a big base box with four drivers on panels above. Yeah, I had a pair of DQ-10s. So you know that there were these metal uh, angle irons holding the uh, panels on, right? Yep. That was the pattern. That was the pattern. <laughs> but it's brilliant. Stop and think. It's this new, different speaker. It has a patent. You don't say anything about what the patent is. What are people going to assume? They're going to assume it was the time alignment. Yeah. <clears throat> and it worked. I didn't know that. I, I didn't either, except I had a friend, Murray Zelligman, who at one time Dave worked with David and was involved when David and he were looking at a combination of tubes and fets. And they split the patent. So my friend had a patent attorney who happened to look it up for, for him. Well, I, I do uh, patent work for, uh, for attorneys and uh... There's a lot of subtlety in patents, but the key is to start with the claims, not the opening text, but towards the very end of the patent, what the patent office allowed. That's what matters. I don't read them carefully, but it's not speaker builder, uh, is it? It's just uh, the professional magazine that Audio uh, Express puts out on speakers. Boris Coyle? Voice coil usually includes some patents, but I never I never read it because it doesn't mean that much to me. Well, those patents are done by Jim Croft, and he's 
he's pretty thorough on doing the patents and we've had a lot of discussions back and forth over the years on different things and uh if you want to see somebody who's got a wealth of knowledge based on the variety of patents that he's seen he's the guy i'm sure but i have i'm impatient and reading through the, the wording that goes there to you know it, it's not for the casual reader the deliberately obscure yes or it's sort of lawyer like which i guess is what it is the fundamental lawyer. So, so Nick, is it about time to open forum, open the meeting? <laughs> I've kind of been waiting for Alvin. Do you know if he's not going to attend or something? I haven't heard anything. I just got an email from him. Okay. Uh, I mean, Alvin and I worked on preparing the announcement, so I assumed he would be here. Yeah, that's kind. Of <laughs> kind of why I'm waiting. Well, maybe just for that. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, we can begin with open forum. Anybody got anything to say? I'd just like to say I'm uh, enjoying you here on Monday morning in Melbourne, <laughs> Australia. Welcome. Nice to see, see you all. Yeah. Nice to see you too. <laughs> I uh, recently saw a YouTube video about the sound engineer at the theatrical performance of Hamilton. And uh, the board he was running was extremely complex. But the main thing he said is uh, that show has an awful lot of dialogue by each actor and he said his objective was to make sure there was only one microphone live at a time mm. that's got to be a job so did everybody have microphones oh yeah and the lead actors had two microphones in case one failed because <laughs> the play depends upon the dialogue. Without the dialogue, there is no play. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, yeah, well, the other thing, too, is I remember when they had, I think it was either a combo BAS AES meeting up at the North Shore Music Theater. They were doing um, West Side Story, and they used a body pack microphone, spirit microphone, you know, just taped across the head or down the side of the face for the performers. But the big failure mode in the microphones was, since it was mostly a, as one of the directors or whatever pointed out that it, West Side Story theatrically is actually a dance musical. There's a lot of dancing and invariably they would break the TNC connector from the microphone to the <laughs> transponder on the back of their on the in the small of their back typically was where it was located and they also had a, another unique problem because of the dancing uh obviously the dancers in an outdoor music theater because this is basically the north shore music theater last i was there was basically in a tent or a supported tent uh humidity gets pretty high sweat gets pretty heavy and initially they started losing a whole bunch of the body pack body pack transponders to sweat and they had to come up with a way to seal them up so they didn't get sweat into them and fail. Is this a, con is this a condom story again? Yes, this is the condom story. They wrapped the, the units in double condoms, and that solved the problem. It's like the third or fourth time. Probably. <laughs> Not everybody's heard it, obviously, from the laughter. <laughs> no. There's a low-pass filter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's I'd like to say... Pretty uh, good too. That's a really, really penetrating story. Oh, but, um, <clears throat> uh, many years ago, I went to a performance <clears throat> at the North Shore Music Circus with Rosemary Clooney, mm. and uh, there was a lot of noise in the microphone, and she could barely get out a few bars before the crackling interfered. Uh, they quickly substituted a second audio uh, pickup. That failed. She canceled the performance. Ouch. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Bad cable. Our webmaster, um, Barry Ober, 
has done yeoman's work for the BAS for some time now. I've known him since the 80s and DBX days. He's a real old veteran audio guy, smart, funny, acerbic, struggling. And uh, David Hadaway circulated an email that he got from a friend of Barry's that he is failing very, very badly yeah. in hospital. And it looks very grim. So uh, we will all do well tonight and the next few days to keep Barry in our minds. He's not been much of a presence online. He did do a show a year or two ago. Um, and he's a fascinating raconteur and um, anecdotalist, lots of clinical experience, lots of every other kind of experience. I only met him a couple of times, but I've corresponded with him. Very opinionated, unlike, you know, the rest of us. Um, but anyway, uh, he is in a bad, bad way. And uh, I just heard about this from David H. Um, a few hours ago. So I'm a little bit speechless, but whether you knew him or not, um, keep him in mind. And uh, his website work has been for us and, the, and his YouTube work for us, uh, sorry, his Facebook work for us has been uh, invaluable. We get lots and lots of uh, hits on Facebook. I don't know if they translate in translate into meeting attendance or uh, membership. I think some of the latter certainly, but a lot of that is Barry's doing. So that's the news about him. Man. And the only other thing I'll add is that uh, Jim Croft is everything Tom said and more. Um, a really oddly large intellect and historian. And like Tom Tyson, who's not a regular BAS member, but a very old timer, Tyson and Croft between them, uh, I don't know, it's remarkable um, how big their uh, memories are. Well, I've always been fascinated by the history of audio. I started in the mid 60s, but there was a magazine called Vacuum to Valley that used to go through the history of some of the old com companies like uh, 10 pages on Dynaco or on Fisher, you know, the names that most people have forgotten. Sure, sure. Sidney Harmon. Oh, yeah. And that was a fascinating magazine. I was very sorry when it, when it stopped after the 20th issue. I was just discussing on Facebook with a smart, uh, one of the very smart crowd out of Canada in the NRC world and an audio guy, Doug, I think it's Douglas Schneider, I'm not sure, smart speaker guy, savvy, but started going off about the long distinguished history of the NRC work, which is indeed long and distinguished. But I had to point out that if any of those guys had been involved in the BAS in the 1970s and 80s, they would have um, not only had allies and colleagues intellectually, but would have seen that a great deal of the lec dems and the uh, blind demonstrations and so on at BAS meetings in the 70s and 80s uh, preceded or augmented their own work. Of course, this guy didn't have any idea what I was talking about. Um, but uh, yes, there's a lot of history there and the BAS um, has had a um, large, large part in uh, capturing it. Huh. You uh, mentioned Barry Over, the name rang a bell and I just looked up last uh, September, I had a I made an inquiry about who created the logo for the Boston Audio Society. And I think it was Dave Moran who told me I should contact Barry. And Barry engaged me in an hour long conversation <laughs> about least. how he chose the font and how we modified the font to get exactly the shading he wanted for the Boston Audio Society logo. Yeah. All right, are you talking about the logo on the website or the logo yeah. or on the stationery, which is the symphony conductor? No, no, the uh, name, the words. 
Yeah, he and Weinberg and I, uh, well, Barry tends to run with things. Thank God. Oh, it, yeah, it was David Weinberg who introduced me to Barry. That's right. Yeah. And but, the, for those of you curious, the font is called Ritzy Remix. We could change our name to Ritzy Remix. That would be good. <laughs> Well, Alvin's here, it looks like. We're talk since we're talking about Barry, I received an uh, email shortly that uh, he is in grave health in the hospital, is not expected to come out alive. So that's bad news, not only for, for him, but for us. He has been our web uh, uh, person for, for, what, several years now. Yes. So uh, it's not good, or it doesn't look good. Yep. Do we have any budding webmasters out there? <laughs> or veteran webmasters? We'll find something. Maybe you can use chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Interesting thought. Anybody else have anything for the uh, open forum? I think David put it in the newsletter on the announcement. I have about 30 years worth of Audio Engineering Society journals. And I'm either going to donate them for David to burn or <laughs> David Hathaway to burn in his, his fireplace to keep him warm <laughs> next winter, or I'll make them available and bring them up to Boston anyway, if anybody's interested in having them. Is there a university library, maybe like Emerson, that would want it? Uh, most libraries these days, I've tried lo local libraries here in Rhode Island, and just about all of them say nobody reads books anymore. They all want it online. And indeed, the Audio Engineering Society has now put, I think, at least probably 70 or 80 percent of the AES journals online for members. Yeah. But you've got to be a member to read it. How about sending it to the Library of Congress? Uh -huh. They probably have it. I did a paper when I was doing my grad school work on uh, the AR turntable, which had an incredible write-up and how it was manufactured and, and, and made. And I got most of the information from AES journals at the time that were in the Boston Public Library. I believe that if you're not an AES member and you want a specific issue of the journal, uh, they will sell you an individual, um, you know, a lot more expensive than being a member of AES, but uh, besides yeah. all the loss of information that you get by having a membership with AES, but uh, you can get individual copies. Is By the way, paper? just, pardon? The paper? Yeah, you can, well, no, or PDF versions. I don't, I don't know about paper. Uh, I'm a member, and when I get my issues, if I want to go back and get an old issue instead of going through all my paper issues, it's just easier to download the PDF again. Uh, just a, another comment, by the way, it was mentioned about AI, um, and it, you know, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but you have to be very careful about working with AI. And I'll give you. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Recently, uh, Marie and I put our house into a trust and uh, all of a sudden, you know, when when you get a title change, you get all kinds of offers for insurance and everything else. Um, I got a letter and it was addressed to uh, Thomas Egg, and then we couldn't figure out what it was. And some AI was going through and scraping all of the recent title transfers. And the title transfer of our house was Thomas and Marie Parazella Nest Egg Trust. Oh. <laughs> so it just went through as a blind machine, you know, scraping information and came up with a whole bunch of information being sent to me at my address and my name being Thomas Egg. And you called your trust the Nest Egg Trust? Yeah, the attorneys did. They called it a Nest Egg Trust. And I, that's how they probably scraped the word egg and attached it to my first name. And so just beware of uh, letting a machine um, do things without being checked. Well, you, you know you, it's you, an AI. 
So Pardon? we should not call you Thomas Egg anymore? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you look at the top of my head, you can call me Thomas Egghead. Oh, I didn't even and think if, of that. If you look course, behind yeah. me, those are my egg speakers. So I, I guess, you know, <laughs> it's going to be focused on me. <laughs> but on the, on the same issue of chat GPT, I think it's fantastic. Uh, the hope is, of course, that they get it working good enough. For example, at the, every, at the end of every Zoom meeting, for example, or at every meeting you attend, when it gets good enough, they'll be able to, as the chat GBT, print out a summary of the meeting instantly. I tried it on that last uh, meeting, and it takes a considerable amount of work to make it fly. But I think it reduced my time on the job for the last meeting notice. If you remember, it was a little crazy meeting. Yeah. I think it reduced the time on the task. So anyway, I've already done it and set it off. But the point is, the future of ChatGBT looks pretty good. The, the fundamental problem with AI is the data it uses. Uh, people who just have AI scrape the internet and get all the blowhards and nonsense for people with no authority at all and just bl blathering on, uh, the the AI result is going to be the output of a six-year-old. Aside from the fact that some people will deliberately put in bogus data just to mislead the algorithms. <clears throat> so the real issue is the choice of data and the filtering of the data. It's sort of like it needs an adult brain behind it. Hmm. Well, and, and what... I would agree right now it does and may always, because like I said, yeah. I started of what is that not 80, true? 80 some pages of original text. AI reduced the uh, summary down to 10. And, and I had to pour over it and the meeting summary. <clears throat> And the video on the on uh, YouTube in order to get an acceptable uh, meeting summary. So <clears throat> it did go from eighty some pages down to ten, but it wasn't good enough, as you report. The hope is that that will change one day. It may be good enough. Well, this AI ChatGPT is not intelligent. This is not intelligence we're talking about. It's a it's a language <laughs> model tool. Uh, that uh, uses predictive uh, statistics to generate the next word given the last few. And, th and that's not intelligence. And, you know, given that it's trained on the internet at, at large, uh, the only intelligence you could expect is the average of the internet at large. So <laughs> I'd be very careful about what I would try to do with that thing. That's depressing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, true intelligent machine or code or whatever is a ways off. I I think uh, what Ken was alluding to is absolutely correct. Um, if you are, whether you're a machine or whether you're a human uh, editor, uh, you have to carefully look at the sources of the information you're using, what is the reliability and consistency of those sources, and then weigh your uh, decisions based on that. To just go at it blindly, well, I've seen a lot of stuff that was written by people that was just as bad as, you know, what you're talking about with the supposed AI. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't alleviate uh, the requirement to verify the mm -hmm. efficacy of the information that you're getting from your sources. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I have an item. Oh. Uh, hello. Yeah, so I have an item about RCA Gold Jacks. Um, my company uses about several hundred Gold Jacks a year, and we buy them off of eBay or, or Amazon. And there was a minor problem of the uh, center contact and the jacks being loose. And so it's not making a good connection. And I had to discard a certain percentage and I did figure out how to fix some of them. But I was a, it was a situation I could deal with. But then a new problem showed up. The, uh, when you try to plug the plug into the jack, it only goes in halfway and stops. And you can't force it any further, farther. Um, you, you're testing all the jacks? 
I test 100% of them. Wow. Okay. Before I put them in the product. Good. And the, I check my plug in the center pin is 0.125 inches in diameter, which is the standard. And amazingly, if I put a plug in there that's 0.124, that is one thousandth of an inch smaller, it goes in smoothly. So, so I complained to the vendor because about a third of them are bad. And he said, we'll give you credit for that. Okay. So then I ordered again, same thing, about a third or bad. He gives me credit. The third time I order and he doesn't respond. <laughs> so I, I, is, I that, go, is that limited to sandpaper? One, is that limited to one manufacturer? Excuse me, Tom, your voice is much louder than everybody else's. Oh. So I wonder if you could turn it down. Okay. I was just wondering if the uh, problem you're having is limited to one manufacturer. Well, the story continues. Okay. okay, so I got 100% credit. So then I went to a vendor on Amazon, same problem. And the second vendor on Amazon, same problem, the third vendor. So they're all operating from the same source. So I may just have to raise the price on the jacks and throw away a third of them and just proceed because it's no hope to uh, have any resolution of this in the future. I think one thing that happened was that because the jacks were loose, they changed the diameter of the inner tube slightly to solve the looseness problem. And they introduced another problem. But the, all of them seem to use the same jack. There are much more expensive jacks out there, but mm -hmm. these seem to be the only source for a jack that costs about 60 cents and is of good quality otherwise. So that's the end of the story. <laughs> How much do the more expensive jacks cost? Maybe the the savings in labor that you're doing with all the testing. No, no, it doesn't take long to test them. It they might buy three, not be three or four dollars a jack. Like, uh, anyway, that could be an advertising point too. Hey, we use uh, Tiffany jacks or whatever they might be. You know? Yeah, well, they're Teflon jacks too, but right. that makes it far more expensive. It's expensive enough. I'm charging people six bucks a jack or no eight bucks a jack with installation. And uh, it was just, there are 18 jacks, so it gets to be pretty expensive. Either that or time to get a bigger hammer. Not unreasonable, though. Well, one, one customer complained when he pushed it too hard, the, the, the guts pushed out the backside oh, yeah. through the crimp connection. <laughs> yeah, I've had the same problem, only it was a while back. I had a bunch of RCA jacks, uh, actually plugs, uh, as the, the M and the F, the receptacle and the plug. And there was a lot, the plug seemed weirdly undersized. And the grip around the, the outside of the, the receptacle was larger or was smaller or something. And it was literally, I did, you know, you had to use an incredible amount of force to get the darn thing to connect solidly. Once you did, it was very solid. And then you had problems yeah. if you wanted to pull it out. Well, yet there's another problem that the diameter of the barrel is, is uh, undersized. Yeah. And I measured some, and there's a there's a certain tolerance for this diameter of the barrel, and most of the jacks are right at the lower edge of it, and some are below the, the limit of tolerance. Mm. So I have to do all this quality control before I put them in the product. <laughs> the mass production was more precise than that. This is Chinese. This, this is Chinese production. Mm. Are these RCA old jacks are so loathsome? Excuse me. Are these RCA jacks have been loathsome for decades. Well, they can. I'm going to write a piece about it in general thing, but they can work as long as the tolerances are held. Oh, sure. It's just a loathsome design. Mm. It's have just they're sloppy from in the, the get go. They're, they're sloppy in their production tolerances. Oh, and when I complain, they say, send us a picture of the problem. Mm -hmm. So what I Ship did was divide sandpaper. It. So I divided them into two piles and took a picture, and that seemed to satisfy them. But ne never did they re show any understanding of the problem. It's just we'll replace or whatever. That paper will take the gold right off. Yes. Yeah. Well, it sounds like they're probably but they'll fit. Yeah. Either that, or they're playing games with the gold coating and making it much thinner or whatever because it's, of the it's only gold. it's only five micro inches thick, so that's not a, a factor. Well. Four micro inches is a lot cheaper these days since gold, last I looked, was running close to $1,000 an ounce. Five, five micro. 2,000. 2,000, yeah. 
Oh, it's, up, it's gone. Inflation. Okay. <laughs> anyway, end of story. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Nick. Yeah. yeah we, oh, just a second. Nick, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, in the magazine department, uh, I don't know what I've got in AES journals. I know I started in about 1958, but I thought I gave away a bunch years ago. However, I do have several years of DB Magazine, if anyone's interested in that. That's much more to our liking, I would say, than the AES Journal, which is much more uh, brainy, let us say, rather than practical. And we're the practical ones, so maybe someone's interested. Another comment on magazines. Do you, there's a bunch of electron, and I forget the site, I could find it, of electronic magazines all the issues available online. The one I, I found first was every issue of audio magazine from the first one to when it died in the 90s is available online. Really? Yeah, I think it's called World Radio or something Yeah, like that. We've cited it in the BAS speaker several times. It's a great site. Fabulous, and it's searchable PDFs, which is a lot of work, really something. Hmm. Cool. Now, speaking of which, we were talking about a while back uh, digitizing all the BAS copies. Has that ever been completed? Yes. For all the issues? I think I so. Believe so. Wow. Okay. Keep up, everybody. <laughs> <clears throat> are, they, are they accessible through the website? No, I think they're available only on disc. Yeah, I.e., you could buy a CD with like the first ten volumes, another CD with the next ten volumes, something like that. Oh, you have to pay. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. A, it's That's like twenty bucks or something. Yeah. Unfortunately, unless you happen to have a computer with a disc drive to read them, um, CDs are are vanishing. Yeah. True, but you could probably copy it or get it to a, a data stick or something. Yeah. It's just a bunch of files. Yeah. It's all PDFs. Maybe we should be offering thumb drives. I don't know. That's probably cheaper these days. Either that or put it online and charge money for it online. Yeah, but then Are you, you volunteering. To... I don't know how to do it. Yeah, you have to get some paywall or some component that accepts money and mm. sends it to a bank or something, you know. I, I don't know that we do any uh, money stuff online. Am I wrong? Guess not. Just pay the pay the do the dues. <laughs> I pay the dues online. Oh, really? Yeah, to David. Okay. Well, yeah, but you're you're not using the BAS website for that, are you? No. Okay. There it is. We just don't have a back end at this at this time. Hmm. Anybody else? Okay, Alvin, do you want to introduce our speaker? I'm not sure if Ken needs an introduction other than to say that uh, Ken is a graduate of uh, MIT. He's been running a consulting business since I've known him, and that's been at least uh, 15 years. And he flies around the world telling people what to do when it comes to electronics in the home or electronics in the office and et cetera. Uh, he lives locally, and uh, he was born and raised locally, and he's a great guy. Take over, Ken. <laughs> I'll, I'll have you as my marketing department, Alan. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. People should mute themselves, by the way. 
Okay, I just want to make sure you see this screen I'm sharing now. And you should be hearing some music soon. Please, uh, Alvin, just confirm. I see your screen very well. And it's full screen. And looks good. Good. Ah, I can hear the music. Good. So it's been uh, since 2020 that I've traveled to Las Vegas for the Consumer Electronics Show. I uh, decided to give uh, live attendance another try uh, last January of this year. Uh, and uh, I want to tell you about my experience there. As you know, audio and video equipment traditionally dominated the Consumer Electronics Show, or CES. There were still audio video uh, uh, present there. It's just not an insignificant presence. However, there are new consumer-oriented businesses well beyond traditional consumer electronics. I want to share with you my impression of the show and a sampling of exhibits representing a wide range of consumer electronics. Uh, the Con Las Vegas Convention Center uh, has a major addition that expanded uh, the size of the hall by about a third. There's about one third the uh, Ironically, the show is actually smaller than the exhibit space that's available now, but uh, the Consumer Electronics Show used both the Las Vegas Convention Center and the Sands Convention Center, which is now called the Venetian Exposition Center. I, uh, I know the folks that, who run the Consumer Electronics Show, the Consumer Technology Association, and I asked why they sort of inconvenienced us by having us travel between two exhibit halls a mile apart. Uh, they had a fleet of buses going between the two locations. And it generally took uh, between the traffic and just moving through the entrances, uh, 30 to 60 minutes to get between the halls. And he said, CTA decided to keep using both exhibit locations because they were concerned that if they gave up the Venetian, that used to be the Sands, they wouldn't be able to get it back when they hoped the show would grow larger at future years. So what I'm showing here is the uh, this welcome CES is not a static sign, it's actually dozens of television monitors all linked together uh, built around these windows that allow you to see part of the hall behind it. So let me uh, show you more uh, with a video clip about the extension of the Las Vegas Convention Center. The um, transportation system you saw using cars in tunnels 
is actually in place. It's from one of Elon Musk's companies called Boring, B-O-R-I-N-G. And he's actually building subways all over Las Vegas with uh, electric cars that have a driver to uh, take people around town. There is one tunnel that connects different parts of the convention center that uh, I actually wrote on. Uh, for those of you that uh, have been to Las Vegas uh, decades ago, the site of this extension of the Las Vegas Convention Center was formerly the location of the uh, landmark hotel from uh, the 1960s. It was built to look like George Jetson's apartment, the original hotel on this site. January 2020 was a banner year for the Consumer Electronics Show. It had about 180,000 attendees who came to see 4,500 exhibits. So as you can see, attendees have, attendance has recovered to about two thirds the level of 2020. I did save the list of audio vid and video exhibitors uh, you can see the stats there of the 218 audio category. Uh, these are self-identified categories. Uh, the, the actual audio uh, companies that we would be interested in were much, much smaller. I have the full list if anyone wants. So what I'd like to do is show you some of the Consumer Electronics Show highlights based on my assessment of products ranging from innovative to weird in a variety of categories, and I did include some audio equipment. Also, I included some exhibits I saw at a press show called Showstoppers. Uh, that uh, was held at, at a separate hotel. It was at the uh, this year at the Bellagio and uh, featured, uh, uh, say, about 100 exhibits typically from smaller companies. So let's start with some of the biggest eye-catching exhibits on the show, show floor. Uh, here is the largest exhibit I saw at CES. It's a caterpillar earth mover used for large scale mining. Uh, here's uh, farming equipment made by John Deere uh, that, who builds this uh, harvester combine. And finally, we have something called the Hispan Suiza Carmen. It's the name of this Spanish and Swiss sports car made by a company called Group Peralada. Group Peralada was formed in 1904. It's sort of a conglomerate. They do wine. They have wineries, they bottle 19 million bottles of wine a year. They own casinos, they manufacture packaging materials and cars. They have a revenue of 300 million euros per year. This car is really special and it's an all electric sports car. Um, fewer than 20 of these have been produced. The selling price for each car is $1.7 million. And they've reported one sale in the United States to a buyer in Miami. There were a number of uh, exhibits featuring application of artificial intelligence for self-driving cars. <laughs> Self-driving cars were sort of all the range, rage a few years ago at CES. Now there's more of a focus on the complexity of driving in the real world that's replete with pedestrians and unpredictable events. AI for video processing is used to assess obstacles and is now touted as a solution for driver-assisted and self-driving cars. Another uh, transportation exhibit that caught my eye was this car that's covered in solar panels 
on the roof and the hood of the car. It's made by a new Netherlands company called Lightyear. The uh, Lightyear Model 2 range is 500 miles, which in itself is very impressive for an electric car. The, uh, the typical long range electric car is more of 300 mile range. Uh, typical uh, gasoline powered range is around 350 miles. The cost of this car with the uh, solar uh, panels is under $40,000. And the Dutch manufacturer is planning US production in 2025. The, uh, this model is called Model 2. Well, actually what they're showing is Model 0. The newest model, Model 2, uh, is uh, based on this older model, which was initially built for $266,000 in the European market. As I said, the revamped Model 2 is slated to be under 40,000. The company claims the solar panels reduce charging requirements by two thirds. And in fact, um, they're planning to sell the excess power that the car can absorb from the, the sun to the local power utility. Here's more about this car. invited by investors to come to the Bay Area. Uh, we're talking with some partners and investors here. This is a place to be for, for companies like ours. We've actually met quite a few uh, very interesting people. Amazing to see the, the prototype in real life conditions. It's great to see the reactions as well. It took quite some paperwork and, and uh, some sleepless nights, but in the end, we made it work. great to be in the US because you can see that everyone is positive about the car. People really like the design. They see in a moment's notice that it's something special and they're interested. Good to be here and it's nice to be on the trip where you can actually feel that you're making a change. Uh, Ken, I don't know if it was appropriate, but did he say anything about what's different about the battery? No, that, that wasn't uh, advertised. Um, I would assume it's got probably a bigger capacity if it's going to store all this excess power and then put it on the grid in the evening. Um, I actually work in the field of renewables, and uh, I think this car has great potential because one of the things we're finding is uh, the grid equipment, namely the distribution transformers, cannot handle the load if you and all your neighbors bought an electric car and attempted to charge it all at the same time. Even at night when the demand for power is low, if everyone in the neighborhood wants to charge their car, and especially if they get a level two charger, which runs off 240 volts, uh, you're gonna put a serious strain on the grid transformers. And the fact that the city of Palo Alto, California, uh, just did a study uh, because it's a very affluent community and a lot of people are buying electric cars, the uh, the grid operator, which is a local uh, uh, city-owned, they're called the Municipal Utility, Palo, Palo, Palo Alto Electric, uh, has to invest quite a bit to upgrade the distribution grid to supply all the electricity people want. 
Did they talk at all about collision safety and what happens to the panels if they're destroyed in a collision or damaged? No, that's, uh, I mean, wh what could they say? If it's well, damaged, it's got to be replaced. No, it's worse than that. They've had a lot of problems with uh, some of the hybrid vehicles in terms of battery disconnects. And they now, most of the Toyota hybrids, and I think most of the hybrids now have an emergency shutoff. Oh, disconnect. yeah. Well, that's a problem even for us, uh, uh, stationary solar, like solar on roofs. Um, the electric companies are demanding that uh, there be a transfer switch available with an emergency shutoff. If mm -hmm. there's a uh, fire, the uh, fire crews have to have something very obvious uh, way of disconnecting the solar panels. Right. And the thing I was concerned about, I know that some of the early Priuses, they ran the power feeds to the motors through the uh, the actual, I guess it was the ridge, I guess on the driver's side. And in occasion, the fire departments have had to use jaws of life to open things and short it out the batteries, which then of course did some very nasty things and can cause fires and such. So yeah, these are lithium batteries, which uh, whose charge and discharge has to be controlled or else they can run away. Right, the electrolyte that's used in the lithium cells is, um, is self-igniting. And once it goes, the only way to put it out is to quench it. Throwing, you know, removing the oxygen doesn't stop it. They're self-oxygenating. Mm -hmm. I ran into this with some stuff I was working on for the Navy. And the other problem is if you get a collision in a car like this that A, has batteries for starters and solar cells, there may be a whole bunch of regulations that may come down to bear on them when they try to export it to international markets. So they may have to, they're, they're probably working on that and they're probably aware of it, but uh, it's a big issue at this point with vehicles, just like the AI aspects are. As well, this is a, a European manufacturer, and generally the rules in Europe are more stringent than in America. The U.S. The U.S. is trying to come up with some special uh, guidelines to actually improve through the uh, Society of Automotive Engineers, I believe, and NHTSA. Mm -hmm. I, I get involved in this with some safety people that I work with or that I have been engaged with at, at conferences and so forth. There's a lot of work going on, but there's also a, a, there the artificial intelligence aspect of self-driving vehicles is also still a long way off. Uh, Ken, if I could just mention something, I don't want to take a lot of time here, but if you are interested in um, the grid and the impact of electric cars on it, uh, I'm involved in a situation right now with the net metering rules that have to do with both the generation of electricity and the transmission costs. If you want some more details on that, I could provide it for you offline. Sure. I appreciate that, Tom. Thank you. Okay. Did the company say anything about how much charge you can get out of the solar panels? No. No. I'm very skeptical about that two-thirds number. <laughs> yeah, well, um, let's see if they actually do make it to become an importer in the U.S., uh, they certainly went to a receptive audience around the Bay Area. Uh, the uh, I heard statistics that uh, as much as almost 40% of new car sales in California are electric cars. For sure, it's above 25%. Ken, I was wondering if you knew uh, if a bunch of us on the street got electric cars and we all plugged them in and said go ahead and charge uh does the electric grid protect itself when it's overloaded or does it just blow up or what happens the answer is generally no the distribution grid well let's just give you the basics here these the uh tra the transmission lines of those cables on steel towers you see you in the countryside <clears throat> The lines on the telephone poles in the city is called the distribution grid. So you'll hear the uh, uh, the electric utilities talking about their T and D network, transmission and distribution. The transmission grid 
interfaces with the distribution grid at substations that are scattered around cities. The transmission grid is instrumented because it covers so many miles that it's difficult to, mod, to send someone out to look at the condition of the line. So they do put instrumentation on it. The distribution grid within the city generally is not monitored. And they depend on you, the customers, to let them know if there's a problem. So if your lights go out, they don't know about it until you call and complain. And then they look at the complaint map and see a whole neighborhood is without power. And they say, oh, we got a problem. Let's roll a truck. The distribution substations do protect themselves. Uh, and it's a pretty uh, basic way of doing it. They have breakers that are not like your regular circuit breaker, but they're big arms that mm -hmm. swing out. But that is like, at the point of catastrophe. Right. Uh, and, I, and I used to work at a place uh, where they had to go out and find out why a substation tripped one time uh, and took down the whole station. And uh, some big factory had a short across the main buses and, and took the substation out. But that is like major catastrophe. It's not monitoring and it's not trying to control the, you know, the flow of power. Yeah, where, where where I live, we have underground um, wiring, uh, and they have uh, junction boxes, which are basically transformers. And in one instance, one of the lawnmower guys hit one of the boxes. It wasn't anchored real well, and we had the electric company come out to reset it. And when they pulled it off, I was rather surprised because typical power, I believe, is two hundred amps per house, give or take in the neighborhood and the transformer was maybe a little larger than a cubic foot. And to run that much power, which would be 600 amps through a, through a cubic foot transformer, undoubtedly it gets a little warm. You can hear them. You're making an assumption that's probably uh, off a little. You're assuming that they've sized the transformer for the peak carrying capacity of each house. Yeah. They don't do that. I mean, the, the, your house may be 200 amp max before the uh, main breaker trips. Uh, but uh, if you came close to 200 amps, well, uh, that's a direct something short, would probably, probably be wrong. Yeah. Well, there have been cases where transformers on the poles have burst and, and literally exploded or, or caught fire. Um, and that's not an unusual phenomenon, apparently, although I haven't heard of any recently, but they well, have had transformers explode. I, I can give you a, a presentation on energy systems, but let me just tell you of a personal incident. My power went out a few years ago, and uh, of course, I called the electric company and they said, oh, we don't know what went wrong. We'll have to check. So next thing I knew when I hear the fire department coming because my neighbor saw a fire near the on the ground near the pole turns out a squirrel ran across the transformer mm -hmm. and burn and was electrocuted and was burning on the ground the fire department was just scratching their head over the whole thing so i figured out what went wrong i called the electric company back and i told them exactly what happened within 20 minutes they had a guy down reclosing the breaker that had tripped a half a block away we we had a similar incident i suspect last night we lost power with a lightning strike and we lost power here for this is in rhode island um and we lost power for maybe a half an hour and i suspect that was how they fixed it they just went someplace and reset the breaker somewhere or it might have been an automatic reset just timed out could be yeah it sort of scares me is the thought of a hot summer day on the East Coast with all the air conditioners on and people wanting to drive the next their electric cars the next day. So they're charging them in the evening. What happens? Yeah, you get a blackout. Hmm. No one gets anywhere the next day. That's what I figured. And we've had it with less electric use. Yeah. Well, not only electric cars are the problem, but there's a lot of impetus 
uh, in the cold pots of the country <clears> to <throat> replace gas okay. heaters with electric heat pumps. Yeah, there's a, that's going to again double the load on the grid. So uh, to achieve the goals that uh, are being set to electrify the United States by 2050, uh, requires going to require a lot of investment in local power generation are also going to have to rebuild the grid. But scary is in the meantime, as you're trying to catch up with the usage, when you may not be building fast enough. The yeah. numbers that the numbers that I heard that if the uh, U.S. is to keep up with the projected demand based on electric cars and other things by 2050, the generating capacity in the country is going to have to be double what it is since the beginning of time till now, which is not likely to happen looking at the permitting delays and everything else. No, but what you're going to see is many, many more people going to local power generation with solar and with storage so they have power at night. Sounds a little hopeful. So let's move on. Let's see. So let's turn to uh, the, the pro a video product now. Oh. Uh, this is called a wireless television. Uh, you it what you actually see here is a fifty five inch television. But the company said you can combine these TVs uh, by butting them up one into another to create a 110-inch TV by combining four of these or a 220-inch television with 16 of these. You see it there mounted to the plate glass window in a hotel in Las Vegas. It uses what's called active loop vacuum technology. The cost is $3,000 for one TV and a base unit, or $9,000 for four TVs together with one base unit. It's uh, supposed to be shipping this year. Let's take a look at a video about it, and then I'll give you some more of the details. Wireless TVs, why don't they exist already? Well, at CES, I finally got to see a completely wireless 55-inch TV called Displace TV that doesn't have any power cable and doesn't have any wires to connect to. It's a thing you can just hang up on a window. Displace TV is a 55-inch 4K TV that weighs under 20 pounds and has its own hot swappable batteries. There are four inside that should give it about a day of use. You could swap them out while the TV is still running. The TV has its own suction pump system that can attach to apparently nearly any surface. We saw it attached to a glass window, which is cool. Apparently it can also attach to other walls as long as they're flat. And it hangs there and plays your stuff. It's got a standard kind of smart TV type interface. And the way it works is by streaming the content from a concealed processing box that's supposed to be about the size of a PC tower. I didn't even get to see that part. Apparently it's still kind of in the works, but you can imagine this is something that's gonna wanna be tucked away versus put under your TV. Displace TV is a platform that can run multiple TVs at the same time off of that same processor box. You could run six TVs or eventually up to maybe eight all with that same system. And that was the original concept of the design. Then it also became wireless and it's also battery powered. It's not that surprising to me for the reason that I feel like we've seen this kind of tech happening elsewhere. I mean, VR headsets are increasingly streaming from other devices like PCs. We have tablets that are running on batteries and play your TV shows. You have streaming games. It makes sense that televisions would enter that spectrum. Displaced TV, though, does look like it's its own kind of self-contained ecosystem, and it's not that cheap. It's $3,000 for one screen and the processor box, or $9,000 if you want to get four screens and a processor box. We played a few sample videos from CNET to take a look at how it performed. It looked nice. You know, it, it's hard to judge a TV in a demo situation um, in a hotel room, but it was very cool that it hung up on a window. It kind of makes me wonder what other places you'd put a TV that you wouldn't normally put a TV. 
Displays TV also supports hand tracking for gestures, but it goes a step further by not even having a remote at all. I'm not sure how I feel about that. In fact, I do know how I feel. I want a remote, but the makers of Displays TV feel that this is good enough that it can work with just hand gestures. My experience with hand gestures is that your mileage definitely varies, but clearly Displays TV is going for an unusual type of customer and a future forward type of person. Whether this technology expands into other types of television, well, you could, could kind of expect that it would. But this is the type of stuff that you see every year at CES in Las Vegas, where new types of tech are being thrown against the wall, literally, to see if they stick. So the uh, technology, as the uh, speaker said, was no wires, no ports. It used the display as OLED. The unit weighs uh, under 20 pounds. It connects via Wi-Fi uh, version 6E, that's the six gigahertz band. Uh, and it, as he mentioned, it has a hot swappable battery that lasts for about a month on a single charge with a six hour per day usage. And he mentioned something about not having a remote. Does that mean if you're having trouble with the TV, if you give the TV the finger that it will solve its problems? You'll have to buy it to try it. Next is a company called Ergo. Uh, the product is called Sound Adjust Plus. It's a hearing aid, basically, that looks like a fly fishing hook. It's touted, it's an in the ear canal hearing aid touted as quote, virtually invisible. Has a backup battery, it supposedly lasts two to three days. Let's look at a little video about it. Hi, we're here at Pepcom at CES 2023 with Ergo, and we're going to find out more about their new product. So what can you tell me about it? What do we have here? And nice to meet you, Eric. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Yeah, okay. so um, um, when you think about hearing loss or hearing aids, what's the first thing that comes to mind to you? The first thing in my mind is amplification. Amplification, right. And how do you like the, the design of, of a hearing aid normally? Um, as small as possible, so pretty as much invisible. Possible. Pretty much yeah. invisible, right. Yeah, yeah. So this is not... Yeah, definitely not that. Prefer, right? Right? No, no, so, no, no, so this. Oh, wait, wait, um, well, hold on. This is here. <laughs> I didn't even notice you had that. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing them right now. Oh um, my God. Look. This device. So which one would you prefer? I guess I know. I know. Definitely, that's, I can't believe that. I did not expect that. <laughs> so, so we like to say if, if, if modern nature would have designed a hearing aid, this is what it would look like. We, we pushed our tech to its limits to make it look, feel, and sound as natural as possible, right. and to basically make it virtually invisible, right? If you wear ergos, you are the only one, and you can see, you are the only one that knows that you actually wear them. So so that's <laughs> new about uh, Ergo. Well, we've been doing this for years, um, but we now announce, we're proudly announcing our latest and greatest product, Ergo 7, um, which we've also truly designed from you know, consumer perspective to make it as hassle-free as possible. And as of last week, it's the latest new over-the-counter self-fitting product um, that's FDA clear. So if you purchase your own, like in the big can buy, uh, you can purchase it from the company online. Uh, you can set it up yourself. Fully set it up yourself. Or and, uh, you then I switched just so they could, you know, check each other's work. By the app. It was quite a. I did not know you had that on. You nice. pulled it out. It, I didn't yeah. expect it to be that. Oh, that seems impossible. To be honest. And that's you know, it's 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 been years of research and development uh, to get it this tiny. Um, it's also um, hassle-free in terms of charging. Like, there's no need to to replace batteries. Um, you can recharge them in the case. I'm going to show you. We have a beautiful case okay. right here. Uh, so you can recharge them in here. And they last a full day on a single charge. Oh, so perfect. once you get up, you plug them in. As soon as you go to sleep, you put them in a the charger. And in the morning, you're good to go again. Okay, that's perfect because you don't want to run out of charge on that in the middle of the day and have to charge it. No, exactly, exactly, exactly. 
Okay, and are they water resistant, dust resistant? They're, 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 they're water resistant, yeah. We don't recommend going for them. <laughs> oh, right, right on. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> they're, they're water resistant. caught in the rain, you should be fine. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 yeah, you should definitely be fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it does say right there. Yeah, it's, and, it says. And so with the and, app, I guess the right. sound adjust plus, so you can, what, adjust the volume? Level? Yeah, no, sound adjust actually means, um, I mean, when you normally walk into a new environment, right? Imagine you're out in nature and you go into a noisy restaurant. Your ears automatically adjust. Any better? That inspired us to create sound adjust. So these ear goes do that automatically as well. There's no need to fiddle around with the device settings or with the, the settings on the app. The device does that automatically for oh, you. Okay. So that that sound adjust. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so what what do you do in the app? In the app, you can I I can, I can show you. Okay. But you can you can choose different programs. Um, so you can set the volumes, obviously. Okay. You can set your noise filter, the noise level, so so the level of noise that you want to clear from the speech. So, so do these work sort of as earplugs as well, or is it just a hearing aid? It's a, it's it's really a hearing aid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then uh, you can set you know specific oh. profiles. Uh, so you can can say like, hey, I'm, I would like to have you know a conversation in a restaurant because there's typically more noise there. Yeah. And you can control all that via the app. But, but as mentioned, with sound adjust, the device also does automatically. Automatic, so yeah. there's no need to pull the app and, and, okay, and do it. That's awesome. The does it for you. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So this is a very good product. Thank you so much for showing me. Thank you for your time. I still can't believe they were in your ears, but thank you so much. <laughs> like that. Nice thank to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs>
touch sensor, so you can pet Pixel. You can also give Pixel treats using a proximity sensor. It also has a uh, just a, a snap and, cl and clap mic, so you can uh, signal Pixel to do as well. It's as, as she said, it's intended for eight to 14 year olds. Uh, and the pet is supposed to teach you, the programmer, new tricks. And to quote the company, whether you're a coding pro or first time coder, Pixel is ready to be your loyal companion. Pixel's interface features step by step instructions for writing code in Python and exploring the incredible possibilities of the programming language Blockly. The cost is $124.99, and it goes on sale tomorrow at Amazon. The technology uses a, a phone, tablet, or PC for connection to the pet robot. Uh, the programming language Block B, as they showed, is a drag and drop visual programming tool that uh, introduces children to fundamental programming concepts, including sequencing, loops, sensors and events, functions, variables, and conditionals through creative program solving. Uh, Python, the other programming language, is a high-level general purpose programming language with a design philosophy that emphasizes code readability with the use of significant indentation. Uh, Python is a professional programming language. And this runs either from a computing device or from something they call a code activator. Next is a virtual caregiver. Digital health technology is transforming the way we care for chronic illnesses, for our aging, and for our child patients. Hi, I'm Addison, the face of 21st century telecare. I'm so excited to get started. It's upgrading how we provide support for both our patients and our caregivers. Digital health is dramatically improving treatment adherence, health outcomes, and the continuum of care. Hi, Tony. You wanted me to remind you when it's time to take your medications. Do you want to take them? Say yes, snooze, or no. With the chronically ill, we're able to improve treatment adherence using scheduled interactive reminders and processes to encourage and confirm patient accountability and progress. We can not only make sure a patient is on track with medications, but we can spot the indications of improper dosing and even an adverse drug reaction. Face the sensor towards you and press down the trigger button for about two seconds. Through monitoring a multitude of vitals, physical and cognitive responses, motion analytics, and AI-powered sentiment analysis, we receive early identification of health decline and anomalies while measuring health stability and improvement. Through seamless connectivity, we can optimize the coordination of care by informing doctors and nurses and members of the family care circle of critical information in real time, thereby expediting early intervention and delivering powerful insights for more accurate treatment engagements. Addison, I'm not feeling well. Can you let my mom know? Okay, Chloe. I will let your mom know. With the breakthrough new Addison Virtual Care System, caregiving takes a quantum leap forward. We're able to upgrade the doctor's health file, provide visibility into the patient's condition, and during an office exam, the doctor instantly accesses an abundance of insights equal to weeks or months of concentrated, organized observational research. In addition to patient feedback and physiological data, Addison processes comprehensive biomechanical information for gait balance and detailed activity performance. Addison is also designed to modernize how we intake, assess, manage, and discharge patients in hospitals, physical therapy facilities, doctor's practices, and in-home care situations. From chronic care to behavioral health to rehabilitation at home, Addison is transformational. In addition to integrated telehealth, automated in-home exams and health surveys, Addison also provides 24-7 on-demand emergency response through advanced wearables and voice. Addison doesn't just support safer, healthier living. Addison helps extend functional independence 
and improved health outcomes. Addison provides a spirit and an exciting paradigm shift in voice and touch-based interactivity with connected health technologies. So this is a, called an avatar for healthcare. It offers telehealth services and care coaching. Um, it deals with uh, routine care. It can uh, call for emergency help and uh, provides data for the caregiver and the doctor. The cost is based on an installation fee plus a care plan activation fee in addition to a monthly service fee. Uh, the technology includes uh, Bluetooth for peripheral devices that might be needed for a custom care plan, such as a glucometer, a non-contact thermometer, a pulse oximeter, a blood pressure cuff, weight scale, or a spirometer. It can be equipped in addition to Bluetooth with cellular backup communications and an uninterrupted power supply if needed for additional protection during power outages or Wi-Fi outages. Next, uh, another robot device. This is Hunit, an AI camera and modular robot arm, 3D printer, laser, pen holder, suction, and AI camera. Hunit is the only robot arm for creative makers. Hunit's AI camera detects and recognizes objects in real time. The recognized objects can also be moved with the suction tool. Tools are easy to remove. Use the laser tool on whatever material you want. And that's not all. Unit can even replace its tools by itself. Okay? Let's continue with our work. The auto leveling for 3D printing. It levels the printing bed easily. Create any 3D object you can imagine with the 3D printer module. You'll turn into an amazing artist with the pen holder module. Enjoy drawing cool calligraphy and artwork. Keep your creativity flowing with the customized tool. There's nothing you can't do with the creator module. The ways in which you can use the creator tool is almost limitless. Unit decides on its own. It networks with you. The touch display makes controlling it simple. And our software makes all the Hunit's functions convenient and practical. Extreme strength, wide working range, quick speed, and high precision. All your ideas can become reality with Hunit. Uh, this device and pre-order price is 2050 to 2999. Green light. Controllable via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Red light. The options include, as you can see, an AI camera with facial recognition, a laser for burning inscriptions, 3D printing, soft ripper, suction pen holder, etc. So this is being touted as useful for education and food and beverage services. Turning to something in our corner of the world, a turntable. Turntables have been making a comeback in a very big way over the last few years. And one of the most notable names in the business, Victrola, has just released a product that provides a simple solution to a question that quite a few people are asking. How do I play vinyl on my Sonos speakers? And the answer to that question is the Stream Carbon Turntable. In this video, I'm gonna go over the specs and features of what is likely gonna turn into one of the most popular turntable options available. To start, the Stream Carbon is a great looking piece of equipment from top to bottom. It's got a minimalistic design with an aluminum and black finish throughout, and the included dust cover maintains the same type of theme and keeps a very low profile. For dimensions, it's just under 17 inches wide, just over 13 and a half inches deep, and about four and a quarter inches high, so pretty compact. 
On the front is a single control knob that can be used to adjust the volume or to select which Sonos speaker group you'd like the audio to play on. Then at the top, you've got a selector to switch between 33s and 45s, as well as a 45 adapter that tucks into its own little spot. At the back of the tone arm assembly is a counterweight, which since this model comes with the Ortophone 2M red cartridge, you'll need to set to the first little hash mark and tighten it down. Next to that is an anti-skate knob and the tone arm lift lever. This tone arm itself is made from carbon fiber, and at the end of it is a removable head shell, which makes it extremely easy to replace the cartridge when that time comes. As I mentioned, you get that Ortofone 2M red cartridge with this one, and it has a little red cap, which you'll need to remove to expose the needle. There's a tiny tab that you put a little pressure on, and it should just pop off. Take your time doing this part, though, because the entire cartridge can come out if you're not careful. The Stream Carbon uses a belt drive system to rotate its die cast aluminum platter and it's pretty simple to attach but it can be a little tough to see inside the space so it is best to have some overhead lighting available. You'll see a little piece of tape holding a small ribbon in place on top of the platter. Don't remove that tape until you're ready to attach the belt. As far as the rest of the setup goes, this really couldn't be any easier. You just scan the QR code right inside the box to download the Victrola app. Plug in the turntable and the app will find it automatically. From there, within the app, you're going to select your default speaker or speaker group. And then, if you want to keep things simple, turn autoplay on. Autoplay is going to make it so that the audio is automatically sent to the same speaker or speaker group every time you start a record. Also, within the app, you do have the ability to adjust the wireless audio delay. The higher the delay, the more reliable the quality of the audio is going to be. So, the Wi Fi in your home isn't great you'll want to set it to the high or max level for the best results. Then, just find your favorite album, set the needle down, and start listening. Now, obviously, the big draw of this turntable is that it integrates flawlessly into a Sonos system, but what if you don't have Sonos speakers? Well, that's not a problem either, because it also has RCA outputs to connect to a non-Sonos system as well. For our testing, we hooked it up to a Sonos Ray and a Sub Mini, and it sounds really good, but ideally you'd want to be using a 5, or even better, a pair of 5s, all of which are available here on app.com. If you already own Sonos speakers and you want to get into vinyl, this is absolutely the best way to go. And even if you don't have Sonos speakers currently and are maybe just looking for a very capable turntable, this is still a great model to consider. Super easy to set up, sounds great even on Sonos's more basic speakers, and it looks really good. If you have any questions about the Victrola Carbon Stream or need any assistance finding the right turntable for your needs, be sure to contact an app specialist by phone, email, or online chat. We're here seven days a week and are always happy to help. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one. The uh, pre-order price is $600 for this turntable. It includes the Audio-Technica ATVM95E cartridge. I saw this at the Audio Techni exhibit. I went looking for our friend of the Boston Audio Society, Frank Doris. The folks at Audio Technica told me he's no longer affiliated with them. So I did not get to see Frank at the show. So let's move uh, on. Ken, before you move on, just a comment about vinyl, because everybody's talking about this huge resurgence of vinyl and then for several years it was quite high but in 2022 it dropped down to uh four percent growth uh it's interesting that about 25 percent of the growth in that year uh was due to taylor swift albums <laughs> and and of the albums that were sold uh to taylor swift people uh 43 percent of them did not even have a vinyl playback system uh, and they were just buying it as collector's editions. And I, I had sent some data out to a few people. In 2022, 43.5 million vinyl albums were sold, and that compares to 1.1 trillion music streams. So uh, that gives you an idea of where um, people are getting their music nowadays. So it used to be when uh, CDs were coming on the market, the uh, people in the vinyl business said, but you're going to lose all the cover art and the liner notes. 
So are uh, people buying Taylor Swift for the cover art? Uh, they're buying Taylor Swift to collect it. They um, don't even play it. Uh, well, 43% uh, of them don't even play it. But as far as the cover art, I've recently gotten a Rune uh, Nucleus, and I've been using Rune and Cobas. And if you pull something up streaming and you go to information, uh, it will give you more information about the performance, the artists, the composer than you'd ever get on liner notes. Huge amount of information there. So that's the sort of equivalent uh, you used to get on uh, DVDs and Blu-rays, the uh, uh, director's commentary. Correct. Correct. And you can get that now with streaming music. At least I'm getting it on Cobuzz and I'm using Rune and I, I am doing more listening now than I ever have before. Mm hmm Moving right along now, back to the energy world. Okay. From your backyard to the mountains, Jackery has your outdoor power needs covered with the all-new Explore 1000. One of the most powerful and compact portable power stations on the market. Weighing only 22 pounds with an easy carry handle, the lithium battery generator packs a massive 1,002 watt hours and is much more travel friendly than traditional field generators. Our system features three AC outlets, a carport, two USB and two USB-C ports, including quick charge 3.0 technology to power your devices more efficiently. A smart LCD display provides accurate input, output, and battery level readings, while the side of the unit features a bright LED flashlight with an SOS function in case of emergency. Take the Explorer 1000 with you everywhere, and you'll never need to worry about running out of power again. Once the unit reaches low power, you can plug it into a wall outlet, car charger, generator, or better yet, try pairing it with our 100-watt solar panels to recharge on the go and completely eliminate your carbon footprint. We've equipped the unit with an MPPT solar charge controller to offer up to a 20% increase in charging efficiency. Set up the ultimate campsite and power your lights, coffee machines, coolers, and even your CPAC machine, ensuring a good night's sleep in the tent. And when the adventure takes you to the backyard, be the life of the party, bringing you and your friends quiet, clean energy while powering multiple devices simultaneously. The unit meets the power supply needs of more high-power electrical devices, so in the event of a power outage, you can rest easy knowing that your Explorer 1000 can serve as a backup generator to keep your essential appliances up and running. Whether you're going camping, road tripping, or just need an emergency power solution, the Jackery Explorer 1000 has your outdoor power needs covered. So it can supply up to 200 watts for five hours on a full charge. The uh... Battery is $1,099, and if you want to get it with the panel shown, the whole package is about $4,000 for the battery and the panels. You can mix and match battery sizes, and as you heard, it can be charged from the grid or from the solar panels. Next, we have a personal care device, kind of unusual, it's this gadget that you wear around your neck for uh, a personal improvement in indoor air quality. Hello, and welcome to my channel, I Know Gadgets. In this video, I'm going to tell you all about Respiray, a drug-free way to relieve your airborne allergies. Respiray Wear A Plus is a lightweight, comfortable device that is both clinically and lab tested. It can reduce airborne allergen particles by 99.9% .9 thanks to its user-replaceable heat bag filters and adjustable straps for a one-size-fits-all fit. It also includes a washable pre-filter to catch larger particles, and it operates quietly with two-speed settings. Overall, Respiray Wear A Plus is a great way to relieve your allergies without the use of drugs. It's simple to use and provides instant relief. So if you're tired of dealing with allergies, check out Respiray Wear A Plus and you won't be disappointed. You can find a link to buy in the description below. Thanks for watching. The uh, pre-launch price was 79. The final price is about $200. It includes HEPA filters at $6 per filter, and it's supposed to last for about eight hours on a charge. Back to uh, audio video, this time uh, video uh, pro uh, projector. 
that has a feature that caught my eye and I'll we'll show you the video and it'll explain the uh, unique setup feature. Notice what happened here, that someone knocked the projector and the projector realigned itself. costs about $1,400. It's a 4K resolution, 2200 ANSI lumens, which is pretty good for a projector. I happen to be in the market for a projector and uh, I like the automatic keystone correction and realignment. I, uh, just as an aside, I spoke to a competitor who claims this device uh, actually has had distortion problems because it uses plastic lenses that uh, overheat uh, the, the ventilation system isn't right, causing the plastic lenses to distort the image. But take it as with a grain of salt, that was a comment from a competitor. But uh, this wasn't the only device that I saw had automatic keystone correction. So I think that's uh, gonna become popular in projectors. Uh, next, we go to a medical device. Introducing the more personal OptiJet from iNovia. Just slide down the safety shutter to activate the light, and look, a touch of a button will gently mist the eye. On the go or at home, this OptiJet was designed with your lifestyle and comfort in mind. And now it's even cooler. iNovia. Making it possible. This device is intended to dispense prescription medicine. It's not just for a, a, a spritz in the eye, uh, like an eye drop. I mean, uh, you know, a, a, what's called liquid tears. It's um, a carefully calibrated FDA approved medicine delivery system. Um, it's had a long road to get approval. And it's pretty expensive. A, uh, they're trying to sell it to uh, ophthalmologists to apply a dosage of uh, dilation medicine that some of you probably had if you've had, uh, uh, if you're uh, my, myopic or uh, have potential cataracts and the doctor needs to look uh, into your uh, retina, they will dilate the pupil. The cost of one spritz of uh, dilation medicine is $50 a dose. And it uh, has a Bluetooth link to track compliance. Uh, it's a, not yet approved for consumer use. It is approved for in-office administration of pupil dilation. Uh, next time I see my ophthalmologist, I'll ask if he's uh, in considering this device. My guess is he'll tell me it's so much cheap for him to just take a bottle, an eyedropper, and drop a, the dilation medicine in the patient's eye, but we'll see. Another uh, medical device, this time uh, for robotic surgery. Neosys has pioneered the first robotic-assisted guidance system for dental implant surgery, called Yomi. It provides dynamic planning software that can be changed at any time. Real-time visual guidance so the surgeon can confirm their progress. 
and physical guidance through a collaborative robotic arm with real-time patient tracking throughout the surgery. The procedure starts with a CT scan of the patient. The surgeon plans the surgery, accounting for key anatomical features like the nerve, sinus, and adjacent teeth. Yomi achieves physical guidance through the use of haptic robotic technology. It physically constrains the surgeon's drill movement to match the plan. As soon as planning is complete, Yomi is immediately ready to assist the surgeon in carrying out the surgery the same day. Yomi's real-time visual guidance works like a GPS system. The surgeon always controls the drill. When the surgeon is close to the target, Yomi guides the surgeon into the precise angle and position. Yomi prevents any deviation from the plan. With full view of the surgical site, the surgeon precisely drills the osteotomy and is stopped when reaching the planned depth. This enables a minimally invasive, flapless approach, which can lead to faster surgery, faster recovery, and less pain for the patient. Through seamless integration into the surgeon's operating environment, Yomi achieves a truly digital dental workflow. Yomi. Accurate guidance through robotic assistance. This uh, robot is $150,000 and with an additional fee for every implant. Now, it's interesting. The, the person at the exhibit was one of the inventors, a person, a, a, uh, an implant dentist who told me, he said, well, I don't need this device. I've done this so many times. I get it right. He said, I invented this for the dentist who doesn't do too many implants and might make a little mistake. And this keeps the, uh, the not so uh, skilled dentist from making mistakes, which a skilled dentist would not make. Uh, I, thought only, good... I thought only oral surgeons could do implants. Yeah, but he basically is talking about a pecking order among oral surgeons those that do this all the time and those that do this occasionally. At any rate, what I learned from this is if I'm going to, if I need a procedure like this, I better quiz the doctor how many he's done. And if he says a couple, search for another dentist. So let's go to automobiles. This was a demonstration of a car that can change its stripes. BMW iVision D, rather than simply alternating between black and white, now showcases a multicolored, fully variable and individually configurable exterior. An e-paper film from the BMW Group's cooperation partner, E-Ink, was applied to the body to create this magical display of color. Up to 32 colors can be displayed. The body surface of the BMW iVision D is divided into 240 ink segments, each of which is controlled individually. This allows an almost infinite variety of patterns to be generated and varied within seconds. The laser cutting process used to trim the films and the electronic control design were developed in partnership with e-ink. E-ink, by the way, is an MIT invention that's the basis for the Kindle display. So, you know, one of the most important determinants of what car you buy is the color. Uh, I've read that uh, dealers uh, basically can close the deal if they have the right color for the customer. So. This might make selling a car easier and deal with fickle customers. Next, we go back to the human body and this time the brain. Introducing Friends Brain Band. It's the world's first consumer wearable that can track and stimulate brain activities to facilitate better quality sleep, focus, and unleash human potential. Powered by neuroscience breakthroughs, Friends precisely tracks brain signals, biovitals, and facial movements, then delivers real-time and personalized contents to facilitate deep sleep, deep focus, and deep relaxation via bone conduction speakers for the most seamless experience. For daily use, 
and nightly use. Now is the time you can start saying, hey friends, let's go to sleep and let friends AI assistant take care of the rest. Friends brain band, deep sleep, deep focus. So it's using deep bone conduction to send signals to, uh, I don't know, to the brain or maybe into your hearing system. It costs $350. And to quote from the company, according to the Center for Integrated Healthcare, 2013, deep relaxation is an active skill you can learn to gain better control over your body. Deep relaxation aims to release tension and lessen the tear of life's challenges on the mind and body. Uh, the inventors are associated with the uh, University of California, Colorado and Children's Hospital Colorado and the University of Oxford, England. So it sounds like legit credentials. I make no claims of whether it works. But it doesn't send electrical signals to your brain. There are it just says bone conduction from what I, my research delivers personalized content by bone conduction, and it supposedly reduces the time to fall asleep. So another uh, health device, this time it uh, deals with the muscular skeletal system for people that have to be on their feet all the time. is called an exoskeleton. And it's billed as a chair you can wear. Costs about $3,000. It's made of uh, flex carbon. Uh, which is supposedly 25% lighter compared to metal. It weighs between four and six pounds and supports a 175 to 200 pound person and whatever load they're carrying. And back to audio. Uh, this is a device that's touted to improve dialogue clarity. As we get older, hearing loss is the norm. More than 37 million Americans have difficulty hearing. Our ears have taken a lot over the years. Kids banging pots and pans, loud tools and machines, music or concerts turned up a little bit too high, fireworks, you name it. A full life is usually a loud life. Eight and a half percent of adults aged 55 to 64 have significant trouble hearing. But that rises to nearly 25% for people 65 to 74 and 50% of people 75 years and older experience hearing loss. Designed in Japan, the Mirai speaker is made to increase comprehension of TV, computer, and radio speech. It does this through its cutting edge curved panel audible wave technology. This technology produces clear, crisp, and distinct sound waves that bring speech and dialogue into high clarity. The key to clear dialogue is this speaker's curved panel sound technology. 
When I play this music box by itself, it sounds like this. But now, if I hold the music box against this plastic panel and curve it towards you, the difference is obvious. Setting up the Mirai speaker is simple. For most TVs, just plug in the audio cable and you are set. While the Mirai speaker has proven successful in the Japanese elder care market, we need your help to launch this product in the U.S. Backing us and successfully funding our project will give us the funds needed to expand into the United States. For more than 85% of people who have used the Mirai speaker, there is a noticeable difference in speech comprehension. Will you support the cause by backing our project? Let's help people hear better sound, not just louder noise. They are looking to launch this month. The cost is about $300 for the speaker. Uh, as you can see, it's hardwired to a television analog or digital audio port. So to wrap up now, the uh, largest booths continue to be the audio video equipment. What you see here is the entrance to the LG booth. <clears throat> the entrance uh, is down here. You see this huge number of people there. And they are surrounded by 280 55-inch televisions using flexible surface technology to conform to the curve here with a special video production with one uh, image that spans across the 280 televisions showing a custom produced nature movie. These are actually, I don't know if you can see it well, these are animals at a watering hole. Uh, I think these are a bunch of uh, lions drinking at a watering hole on both sides with very uh, dramatic looking clouds above. So the fundamental question for the future of uh, CES, will CES recover to pre-pandemic levels and then continue to grow? Because Las Vegas can support a CES 50 to 100% larger than the 2023 show. Will companies be as generous with employee travel as pre-pandemic? Or is a combination of virtual and in-person shows the new normal? So I thank you all for participating. And uh, of course, if you've got any additional questions, here I am. Thanks. I, I think the, that's the new normal, as, as you said. Uh, I, I don't see people, uh, I don't see companies sending a lot of people traveling to do big shows and, uh, you know, expensive displays and things like that anymore. I think you're right. I, I It's not going to be uh, cut to zero, but it won't be a situation where half the company is allowed to go to a show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Super presentation, Ken. Where did you get all those videos? Um. Well, first I uh, went through all the promotional materials I collected because I went with press credentials. I get a lot of materials in advance of the show. So I kept building up a, a collection of things that caught my eye. Then as I went around the show, I took note of which exhibits I thought are worth sharing. I took photos in some case, and then I searched the web, uh, searched for images and the videos were all YouTube videos. Wow, that's great. <laughs> so that's uh, what the manufacturers just have to do these days. They have to have a highly produced video. And those don't come cheap. None of those were amateur productions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the way of the future, I think. <laughs> I mean, it would be the, interesting uh, to find out what the cost of putting on a highly produced show display have your people standing around you know compared to the video cost well a, a 
booth that uh, we used to go to uh, trade shows uh, in in high tech were hundreds of thousands of dollars just for the the physical materials to take up uh, you know a thousand square feet or so. Um, but when you add all the video productions, there you're talking tens of thousands of dollars, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm wondering, at least that projector overcomes the problem of trying to stick the stick on TV to your ceiling. <laughs> sure, well, I wouldn't be comfortable with that. <laughs> so do you have any opinions on a short throw projector versus a traditional rear throw projector? Short throw versus long throw, you mean? Yeah. Not me. I don't know enough about them. Uh, Jim Dukas has a short throw projector, i.e. it's just about against the wall where his screen should be. He doesn't have a screen yet. He just projects it on this, uh, you know, blank, blank wall. And uh, he likes it. It's uh, pretty good. Of course, his wall is not terribly flat. It's not color correct because uh, there's not a real screen. Yeah. You can actually buy special paint if you want to use a, a flat wall. Yeah. <laughs> and you have a wall big enough. I'm thinking that uh, the, the big difference is you probably have a, a fixed screen size with a short throw, but with a, a long throw normal projector, you can expand the size to make it a wide screen. No, no, the short throws can be moved back and forth by uh, a foot or two. And uh, they tell you in advance how the biggest screen they can fit. Well, mine is at a press of a button. I turn a regular screen into a wide screen. Oh, wait, are you talking about the aspect ratio? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a different issue. I'm talking about filling the... the whether you have an 80 inch screen diagonal or 100 or 120, that you can control by the distance. Now, when you're changing the aspect ratio, um, it used to be on, uh, on rear projectors, if you wanted to do it right and capture the full area of the chip, that you needed to have a CinemaScope lens or an anamorphic lens no, nope, not anymore. No, okay. It's sharp as a tack and just as bright uh, in widescreen as it is in normal screen. And, what uh, uh, what brand projector are you using? Uh, Epson 4010. Hmm. And you use the term rear screen. It, it wouldn't be called a rear screen. I mean a rear projector. A, uh, no, no. A no, long uh, throw projector. A rear projector is behind yeah, the I, uh, screen, That was right? behind the screen, yeah. No, yeah. I'm talking a lot. Hey, yeah, okay. Is the right term a long throw versus short throw? I suppose. I haven't thought about that. Anybody? Makes sense. Yeah, rear, rear throw is something different, but... Uh, it's it's a good question and good of terminology. <laughs> you know where I've seen the rear projectors at uh, conferences where they'll put up screens in the front of the room and the projector will be actually behind the screen with a translucent screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Raytheon, where I used to work uh, here in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, their their main conference room had a rear projection system. You never saw the projector; it was just a large kind of. Um, uh, it, it was like a hazy screen, but when you put the projector on it, it was dead nuts. And that's how we did our death by PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> <clears throat> so see, you now it's PowerPoint isn't enough. You need uh, video in the interspersed to keep yeah. people awake. Well, you can do that with PowerPoint too. You can actually intersperse video in, into it. You can introduce it. And there well, that's what I other... did. The, the latest versions of PowerPoint allow you to add in audio yeah. and video clips dump all kinds of stuff in and the very latest versions allow you to produce a a fully integrated mp4 video for export 
gasp. Gives a whole new meaning to death by PowerPoint. <laughs> well, you become your own movie producer. Yeah. And tie that in with chat, chat GPT and it really gets interesting. Not really. Well, I've seen a number of uh, YouTube videos now where it seems that the uh, there's, there's narration, but it's all computer generated narration which sounds almost human until they get to certain words where it's clear the computer didn't know what the word was and they spelled it out. Yeah, it's like <laughs> listening to your GPS say, oh, turn left to go to Haverhill. <laughs> right. Haverhill. Yeah. Hey, what is, uh, that was that it? What no. is anybody using for a video editor now? Like Ken? I use Cyberlink when I need to do editing, and it's pretty powerful. Uh, a lot of people are using Adobe Premiere. Yeah, I just, I just uh, downloaded. Uh, uh, I use Power Director. Wow. Yeah. I just downloaded uh, Adobe Premiere Elements, which is the simpler version, and it's really a wonderful little program. Oh, yeah. They're getting quite sophisticated. Is that a freebie or a pay program? <clears throat> It seems to be free so far. <laughs> my, my computer died a week ago, and I had to replace the hard drives, and then down and you know reprogram everything. Oh, okay. so uh, some things wouldn't load. Like uh, I had Vegas video editing, and they're supposed to have uh, a, a Blu-ray DVD burning program, and they they stopped that. They won't support it anymore. And Adobe did the same thing to me a couple of years ago. They won't let you make Blu-ray or regular DVDs. Everything is streaming. Mm -hmm. yeah, Cyberlink has a whole bunch of stuff in it that it's amazing when you start digging through all the stuff. I don't use a lot of the, the backgrounds or the special effects or a lot of the other stuff they have, but it's a, it's a barrel full of stuff. And I guess it's produced in Taiwan from what I can gather from the software, but it's, they have audio processors, they have video processors, they have uh, all kinds of um, special effects stuff. It's really a monster and it's a monthly thing like Adobe Premiere is, you pay for it, but they can make Blu-rays, they can make CDs or DVDs rather and Blu-rays if you have the hardware on your laptop or computer that will burn Blu-rays. <laughs> Cyberlink, I think I have that, but I'm not sure. I yeah, used to have, have it. A, they have a scaled down version of it too. I think that you, you know, it's kind of like the 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 Adobe Premiere thing you talked about. You mean you can buy a free scaled version and then trade up if you want more features? Um, it's a limited type, you know, device uh, software. It's you know, it, it's in it. It's to introduce you to some of the stuff. But it's not. It's like the free version of uh, Adobe Acrobat. You can do a lot of stuff with it, but you can't generally create PDF files. You can't edit PDF files, etc. You need the professional version of Acrobat to do that. Yeah, uh, that's the same program I have, Cyberlink. I'm just referring to it as Power Director. Yeah, and Power it Director. does scale down. It used to come free, uh, uh, which I think there's still a free version available, which has. 80 to 90 percent of everything else in the larger versions. Mm. Yeah, I get the uh, what is it, the Power Director or the Cyberlink 365, I think they call it. And that's the full, you know, that's a power, that's a pile of stuff. That's <laughs> what I have. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, I forget what I pay for it. I think it's it was like 10 or 20 bucks. A month, ten or about ten bucks a month or something, give or take. It wasn't frightfully expensive. I forget now what I'm paying for it. I just when I need it, I need it. So it's there. I have done some occasional video editing, and there's a whole variety of freebies, at least for simple editing, like just excising pieces of videos. Actually, the one that comes with Microsoft, which is free if you have Windows, is really pretty good. What do they call that, Elvin? 
Uh, let me look. <clears throat> it's called a Wonder Share. Um, Wonder Share. That's a video editor. Yeah, Wonder Share. The more, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Is it packaged with Windows 10 and 11, or did you you download it? You download it, and uh, how it comes. I, I, obviously, I have it, but uh, it used to be under a different name when Microsoft had it. But now it's Wondershare, but it's still free. And it's very good. And how you get it, which is what your question was. And I assume if you have Windows, you just type in Wondershare and you download it. With Windows or with Microsoft? Uh, I, I'd say uh, Microsoft, but I'm not sure of the difference. You mean, do you go to Microsoft for it? Do it is Wondershare is a separate company from Microsoft? It's, it's, let me look at it again. Um, or is it a part of Office? It's a good question. There's a Wondershare.net that seems to uh, offer software. Does it say video editing software? Yeah, it talks about convert your videos faster, massive library of creative effects for your video. Okay. So that I just typed in, uh, you know, Wondershare in the uh, URL box. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe that's it. It sounds like to me, and it is very good. And uh, it's a more sophisticated version of what Windows used to offer which is also good. I had to put together a video based on uh, VHS videotapes recorded decades ago. I was uh, asked to be part of a panel looking at the evolution of the home automation industry. So I dug up some videotapes from some of the earliest trade shows and put together a couple of minute video for the audience and compared it to exhibits now. And uh, frankly, the only thing that changed were the televisions. Instead of being CRTs, they're flat screens. Beyond that, the promises of the uh, technology and the consumer features hasn't changed. What did you <laughs> use to play VHS tapes? A, a tape player with a device from Aver Media, which digitized it. And I put it into my computer and then worked on uh, excising excerpts from the video file. Effectively a scanner. Well, a VHS player, they're hard to find it anymore. I have some, but they're slowly breaking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's my problem. I probably have <laughs> half a dozen or so of one type or another, and I don't know whether any of them work. It's like audio cassette players, same problem. Hmm. Yeah. There are a number of uh, independents, though, that do have the ability to transfer stuff like that but for a fee, of course. I have a room full of VHS tapes that I spent over probably about 15 years doing high school hockey games and baseball games and so forth for the local high school. And I'm debating whether to try and digitize them all and hand them to the local high school for their archives or whether just to deliver the boxes. <laughs> it's like something that nobody would ever watch. 
Well, actually, it turns out right. a couple of the players on the base on the football teams uh, made it to the pros, and there'll be you know some interest perhaps someday in some of the guys. Although last I heard, one of the guys that did make it to the pros, he's now working for Sears, which is a limited limited future from looks of things with Sears company. Uh, Mm -hmm. Well, find out the most successful pro and have them fund the conversion. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right. mm. Just yeah, they make good boat anchors, I'm told. <laughs> Can I touch on an audio topic for a second? I, I just went through uh, some sure. tweaking tweaking of my surround system and uh, I'm trying to get demo discs to try it out on is murder. Um, I got a Blu-ray player that can play these discs like from the Dolby disc that they sent out to people in uh, 2015 or 16. And uh, I got a hold of one of those and I tried to play the surround um, demo individual tracks that's supposed to go to your various speakers and it didn't work. So I found out that there's a, an odd setting in your DVD player that uh, if you don't know about it, you're not going to get the channelization correct off of Dolby Atmos. And uh, then I tried to put on an Auro 3D. You know Auro 3D? It's a uh, it's supposed to have height channels, mm. several of them actually. And uh, that wouldn't play through the right channels either unless I selected the right kind. There's Auro 9.0, 11.0 and 13.0. And I don't know who could play those or who's interested, but uh, <laughs> then you interface with your um, receivers, various um, surround settings. And if you don't have that right, it won't work either. So I, mm. I got very confused and uh, I tried to settle on what I was always using for TV shows and everything else and music shows and, and stuff, but it, it can really get involved. Mm. But I love it. <laughs> what was that setting in your uh, Blu-ray player that you talked about? Oh, God. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but it's it's an obscure setting that if you set it the wrong way, you know, usually there's there's one of two ways you can set something, and if you set it the wrong one, then it either won't put out it won't play 3D or it won't put out uh, the right surround signal or something unbeknownst to you if you didn't uh, study the manual. <laughs> And it'll, it'll probably vary with everybody's different brand of players, so there's no use in trying to tell you what, what it was on mine. Hmm. Speaking of uh, Atmos, the uh, Philadelphia section of the AES is going to have a meeting on May 16th, uh, and they're going to be talking about, uh, it says, come learn about the evolution of surround sound formats and the core concepts, tools, and workflows that have made Dolby Atmos the leading immersive audio platform for content creators. Uh, a couple of guys from Dolby are going to be on hand, and it should be an interesting presentation. And Gary, you said you were trying to get uh, connected to see it uh, online. If you can't be there, were you successful at that? No. It, there's a little line at the bottom <clears throat> of the uh, ticket sales site where it says you could possibly see it online, but I wouldn't wasn't able to register in that. I forget the exact problem, but um, maybe you need to be an AES member. I don't know. Well, of course I'm an AES member. Then uh, it should allow you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I downloaded an AES journal issue that's supposed to be all about immersive uh, audio and. Uh, and there's another point. I, I'm interested in surround sound, and I can record surround sound of my own. But um, if you tr if you look online for some great music discs or anything, 
in surround, you can't find them. Like a music disc that is done in Atmos, say. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the problem is, but uh, you, you can't go to uh, Amazon and find, uh, for example, a, a bunch of surround sound uh, or Atmos music. Uh, there's movies, of course, but anybody? Uh, Gary, you, you might want to talk to... No, Gary, you might want to talk to Tom Horrell. I remember he in the past was, was talking about this with various kinds of surround sound. You know Tom Horrell? No, no. I've heard the name. Well, I can give you... Yeah, he's... Uh, um, okay, well, I can, I can send you as an email if you want to inquire. Okay. He's former BBN. Hmm. And Accentec. Yes. Anyway, I think surround is the new paradigm of audio if you're interested in realism in audio. Well, immersive stuff. There's been a lot of the AES conferences. In fact, I think there was one recently that was exclusively immersive audio. Uh, a few years a ago, CES was featuring 22.2 surround sound. Yeah. Yeah, Han Cook over in UK has been doing a lot of stuff. He has really been doing some excellent live recording stuff. And he brings his demos to this AES convention that I went to in New York a number of years ago. And they're still pursuing it, coming up with various techniques to be able to record it. It's, but it's, it's one of those deals, I guess, where you really have to kind of, there's no standard to do multi-channel recording um, and what what and it's really kind of up to the director the producer of the recording as to what kind of system they want to use or how they want to implement it or do they want you to walk through the orchestra I think Alvin had talked about a little bit about that when you were talking about that microphone with the paddle configuration and all the mems that's but silliness you literally walk around through the orchestra and stuff it's it's an interesting area, but I'm not sure the public has accepted it yet because most people either listen through virtual headsets or they watch television. And whatever television provides is what they get. Well, that's the point. If you're watching TV or a movie, you're at the mercy of the director where your focus is. Mm -hmm. Which is as it should be. Yeah, and that's why I think you find much more control of surround sound in movies, whether it's streaming or a disc. Yeah, and and I'm not necessarily talking about the kind of surround sound that we had in the quad era, where there's silly stuff going on behind you, but uh, I think that it can expand the stereo sound stage and make it almost limitless uh, as far as 180 degrees in front of you, which is neat. Well, again, as, as, I, as I recall from the, from the presentation that the folks did from the UK, I think they're tied in with, I want to say Oxford, but I'm not sure. Um, the presentation they gave was very impressive, but you have to be in kind of the sweet spot to appreciate it. And it makes it difficult uh, for multiple listeners to hear what's going on. But for those in the sweet spot, it's pretty impressive in terms of being immersive. You you feel like you're in the audio space where the recording was made. Yeah. It's like if you're too close to one of the side speakers, then you're obviously going to hear that too loud. Right. But if you're in a reasonable spot, um, and if there's the producer doesn't put too much sound directly to the left or right, mm -hmm. which they shouldn't, uh, then it's just the same sound stage, only it's not limited by the two speakers that we're, we're all used to. It, uh, it goes way beyond them. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine the, the sound 
going past the front wall, a little bit around the side walls. And of course the ambience is, if, if it's been recorded, is all around you. Mm. That's what I'm trying to do anyway. That's, that's where the 22.2 channel systems start coming to the fore, but who's gonna, whose wife is gonna allow you to do that in your living room? <laughs> well, the 22.2, from what I remember, included speakers overhead in addition yeah. to sides and back. Right. Yeah, it's immersive again. I mean, I'm surprised they didn't figure out a way to vibrate the floor somehow. Either that or you go into a large anechoic chamber where you're literally on a mesh uh, in the center of this big structure where there's acoustic panels all around you, and then you just literally create an artificial acoustic environment through the loudspeakers that surround you. What I've heard is that Dolby Atmos is kind of emerging as the standard for uh, music production in surround sound. And is Atmos an, an, a method for encoding all the discrete channels? Uh, I might say it's, it's more a way of rendering them. Mm. I'm I'm not sure about the encoding, the the uh, that uh, ping pong paddle microphone can record uh, a whole bunch of uh, channels from the MEMS thing, but uh, they have software which is uh, usually a plug-in for audio workstations uh, that will render to Atmos, will render to uh, 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 sound field and. Uh, ambisonic and so forth. So you have to tell it what your speaker distribution is. You know, maybe even uh, they would have uh, apps that could record, you know, send sounds to your speakers, record them, measure time delays and so forth and, and, and automatically program the renderer to produce the correct sound field for you. But Dolby's marketing uh, uh, force, I think is going to dominate the, uh, the uh, certainly the pop music scene where uh, they are trying to emerge as the standard for this surround sound. And uh, I, I hope somebody see, sets up a standard. Yeah, I can see it winning because people are slowly migrating towards Atmos sound systems for their uh, AV rooms. So uh, I think music will move into the 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 rooms the functions the facilities that they have to uh, to do movies with yeah it pretty much is the standard now when you tune into a movie in your home theater well it, it's an advanced standard for you know for for even movies i mean atmos is a recent thing but uh, uh dolby is trying to muscle it <laughs> into the whole world basically so I can see that happening. Is anybody here following ATSC three? Yeah, I, uh, I met with the uh, organization that's uh, promoting it. The uh, I, I know the president of the uh, ATSC Alliance, and they're not having smashing success, shall we say? Do we get? Uh, a representative uh, for the BAS because people are starting to try it. And I've been told that our local stations, uh, which are broadcasting the signal. Did they they are, weren't on at the time of the show. They were slated to go on, but they hadn't. Are they on the air now? They're on now and they are encrypting. Why? So, yes, your tuner has to be a, one of the tuner that's not on the market yet or something like that no no it's not encrypted it's just not until understood by atsc2 you have to buy a new tuner no there's no, no atsc2 no. there's only atsc1 and 3 you need a new tuner for 3 but i mean yeah encryption was an optional feature and apparently the local stations are right. encrypted this is according to John Emerson, who's not a BAS member. I mean, they're encrypted, so unless you buy the right equipment, you can't record it or something like that? No, you can't even see it. He has bought uh, silicon dust 
I don't remember the, the model number, but the ATSC 3 tuner that they have. And he's bought another one, which I can't remember. And he says all of a sudden he can't see the channel, the ATSC 3 channels, because the stations decide to encrypt that. And I thought the the rule from the FCC was the, uh, I don't know, channel number dot one stations had to remain unencrypted. But John seems to be implying that even those are encrypted. They uh, backed off and they said ATSC 1 had to be unencrypted in SD. ATSC 1 is unencrypted. In uh, one... Or at least unencrypted as carried by cable and Fios. Do you mean the dot one channels or you ATSC one does not support encryption? The old HDTV standard does not support. Right. Encryption. No, no, this is a little different. I, I didn't mean to mislead you. If a cable operator picks up off the air, they uh, they are supposed to carry the signal at no charge. It used to be the HD signal. Now it's they can get away with the SD signal. So, well, Ken, it, can we get someone on? Uh, do you know anyone that I can contact or you can contact so we can get them on to discuss this? Because it's something that's going to affect everybody 100% eventually. Yeah. Maybe even by the end of the year, <clears throat> or certainly by the fall. So do you know him well enough to get him an invitation? Let, let me think about that. Well, okay. why is it going to affect all of us? The broadcasters are going to cut deals with the cable operators, so you won't even notice it if you pick it up through cable or Fios. Right, but we're talking about over the air here. Right, I don't do cable. So you're saying that uh, the FCC is going to allow them to turn off ATSC-1 by the end of the year? No, ATSC-1 is supposed to survive for five years. Whether it will, we don't know for sure. But ATSC-3, which was supposed to have the primary, the dot one subchannel unencrypted, it appears now that it's encrypted, as well as all the other subchannels on uh, over the air, ATSC3 broadcast stations. So are they intending to charge a subscription fee for over the year? They might. I We don't know what they're intending to do. But, uh, you know, all of a sudden the, the channels went blank, according to uh, John, on his uh, ATSC3 tuners. And it's because they're encrypted. So we're, we're just trying to figure out what's going to happen, what's allowed to happen, you know. <laughs> That's why we'd like to talk to maybe the FCC or an ATSC3 weenie. Or, I don't know. Okay. I'll see what I can uh, determine. That's good. We'd appreciate it. Uh, question? If, um, if I come up with a presentation on surround sound, how do I uh, ask if I can do a presentation to the BAS on here? Just send an uh, email to either one of us, Alvin Foster, David Hathaway, or, or uh, Nick, or to me, just to me. I, I'm typically set, setting up the meetings, but I'm not the only one. So... Do we have a, a list of email addresses. The answer is yes. <laughs> when do you want? When do you want to talk? On the website <laughs> is is a list of members' uh, emails on the site. Well, you know mine, Gary, and uh, I think you know uh, David Hadley's, and uh, and Nick's the only one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to hear it because that's another area uh, surround that is still complicated after all these years. Yeah, that's why I'd like to do something with it. And I was going to work up something for my local club up in Michigan. So uh, if it if it works out, I will contact you. Great. 
We'd love to hear it. <laughs> okay. How many have surround sound anyway? Okay. For for what? For audio, you mean? Or do you mean uh, as well as movies and TV? Well, I guess it would be mainly for movies, but that's fairly standardized. But I, I mean for audio, um, you know, ever since the advent of stereo, we have thought that it was all about the realism of the presentation, right? And uh, that stereo, two speakers is all you need. It's just a simple matter of greater and greater accuracy of the sound or some like that. Um, but that's not the whole story. And I think uh, surround is going to be the new paradigm, just as stereo was after the mono era. So learning how to do it, though, and standardize it and tweak it and do settings, that's still up for grabs. Yeah, I generally release when the record well, the recordings I've made, I don't know whether I'm ever going to do any more because oh, the COVID kind of shut down everybody that I was yeah. recording. But I have been recording in a way that allows me to create an ambience field if I choose to. It was a system that was devised by Jerry Bruck using a figure of eight and a microphone and an Omni. And for each MS. Well, it's more than MS because it's basically, um, and I've talked about it a little bit before with the VAS, but basically um, you use, he uses the KFM 360 from Sheps. And what that is, is kind of a, it's a, it's a globe, a small foam globe that's supposed to emulate a head. And then it's got two little outriggers where the figure eights are front to back. And then it has the Omnis out. And really? by taking an Omni and mixing it with a figure eight, you create a cardioid. And if you reverse the phase of the figure eight microphone, it reverses the direction of pickup on the cardioid. Yeah, the the so figure eight is usually side to side, not front yeah, to back. Well, that's MS. And this is not MS. This is a different way of doing it. And it's... Uh, it's it's actually pretty good, I guess. Uh, I haven't actually tried <laughs> tried to do a full surround recording, although I have recorded using four channels to do that. Um, and uh, that probably was my only foray into doing multi-channel recording. Although I have rigged a playback system using the old Hathler system many moons ago. And that was rather an astonishing result uh that used uh crossed cardioids at about 90 degrees um and with the Hafler system which is basically a four speaker system one center speaker two side speakers and one rear speaker i can still remember vividly listening to a recording i did way back in the day down at the uh what do they call it it's the boston Circle cyclorama building or the building next to it, which was an old, it was an old vaudeville house that was converted to a theater. Uh, and I guess it's still in existence. They've hopefully managed to fix it a lot, fix it up a lot better than what I did for recordings. But one side of the, um, of the building is on, I believe it's Berkeley Street in Boston. This is reaching way back. And right at the opening of Beethoven's Fourth Symphony, which is very quiet, all hell broke loose at the fire station and they came down and I was just using a single, uh, well, it wasn't, it wasn't a single, it was a coincident pair microphone in XY. And listening on the Hafler system, I was astonished to hear the fire engines come down on the right side and go behind me and fade off in the distance using just four speakers for playback. <laughs> and it really it works <laughs> yeah. and it's very simple to do uh and the wiring the only real real rub is you have to have an amplifier that is common grounded for all the ground connections for the front speakers and then you bridge the rear speakers across the two stereo outputs and yeah. it's it's a it's a pretty impressive system but they made dynaco for a while made a little box that you could switch and change various things. And um, it was 
it was a neat system that worked very well. But uh, the XY uh, microphone technique basically is is to car cross cardioids. So you lose some of the ambience in the process of doing it. Where that's all going to wind up, I don't know. But Jerry Brock's system allows you the flexibility of recording basically all the stuff in front. And with a little of technical jiggery pokery, you can record everything if you want to on in back. <laughs> but it takes well, course, more microphones to do it. Yeah, of course, what you want to figure out is a system that is not a dedicated system for only you, but something that will play back on a normal uh, Dolby surround system uh, like any receiver will have nowadays for yeah. home theater. So if you can make recordings for that, then people could play it and you can well, set up your own home system for it. And if you have the appropriate channels, I believe you can pump it through a processor, a Dolby processor that will do that and create the Dolby, the Dolby technique. In fact, I think I would have to look. I think the Cyberlink video thing has that capability. And I know some of the audio software that I've tinkered with uh, Wave Lab uh, has the capability to do multi-channel stuff for surround, and but I'm not sure how it would be processed. You need a, you need probably a Dolby box or some kind of software um, app that's a plug-in that will process it into Dolby. And I'm sure, knowing Dolby, there's probably a fairly healthy fee for that. Hmm. Sounds like a bigger subject that I can handle. Anyway. Tom Holman has a book out on how to do surround sound mm. recording and playback, I guess. I, I don't have it, but yeah. I don't think I need it. What's Tom doing these days? Is he retired now? Or I know he was out with, uh, with uh, George Lucas, and then he wound up teaching at, I think, University of Southern California for a while. I don't know whether he's still teaching, but I haven't seen him in ages. I don't know. I, I had a tour of the, uh, what do they call it, the ranch or the... Oh, uh, wow. Skywalker Ranch. Skywalker Ranch, yeah, with Dave Clark a long time ago. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's the only thing Lucas hung on to. He gave the rest over to Disney. <laughs> but he <laughs> hung on to the Skywalker Ranch for sound processing. Soul to soul. <laughs> Again, we're talking audio history here. <laughs> yeah. Well, By the way, I... if you want to read an interesting book on audio history, uh, it's a book basically more on the technology. It's called From Tinfoil to Stereo. And it goes through the early history of actually recording audio and then reaching to you know the various things that came along from Edison's tinfoil machines right through to stereo reproduction. And I forget, I forget the author's name. Again, it was one I read God, I think I read it when I was in high school, which was probably about the same time the keel was laid on Noah's Ark now. <laughs> Indeed. Well, if that's all, I want to say thanks, Ken. You pick cool yeah. stuff and you <laughs> show us a lot of fun things. Glad you liked it, Nick. Thank you. <laughs> nice job. To the next one. And with that, I will uh, bid you all adieu. Hasta la vista. Bye. Bye, everybody. Take care, all. <laughs>